Well, I want to read you what the, his own publisher says right here on the uh, this right here on the front cover. I'll read it to you. The terrorist bombings in Oklahoma City and at the World Trade Center were only his first predictions. In other words, he predicted the 93 World Trade Center bombing. Now in this declassified thriller, Keating tells what's next, and U.S. intelligence agents aren't calling it fiction. Inside the cover, it said the final jihad is a prophetic blueprint a warning of horrifying upcoming acts of terrorism targeted at the United States. It's a wake-up call no one should ignore. This book was written by the brother of the Oklahoma governor at the time who had just been elected governor a few months before. He had been sent from Washington with sufficient funds to win the gubernatorial contest so that he could control the investigation of the bombing. Because uh, even though it happened in Oklahoma, the Oklahoma State, the OSBI as we call them, Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation never investigated it. The Oklahoma City Police Department, who has jurisdiction, never investigated it. Oklahoma, Oklahoma County Sheriff's Department, which had jurisdiction, never investigated it. It was never investigated by anybody except the FBI. And I believe those are the same people that said uh, Kennedy was killed by Lee Harvey Oswald. Talk more, if you could, about the intimidation threats against you, but then separately, the more broad intimidation threats against patriot groups, against third-party candidate supporters in this country, and the attempt to, <clears throat> uh, to foretell another Oklahoma City-style bombing where they're just going to clamp down domestically more and more on this country as we've seen in so many cases uh, in the news. I'll start with my personal uh, experience and then turn it over to James to tell you about the intimidation of other citizens here in Oklahoma. But uh, <clears throat> the intimidation started the first day of our grand jury meeting. It continued on a daily basis uh, when it was not deemed to be effective enough uh, the FBI was sent to my home, and on one occasion, I, my office is, uh, sits in a bay window right in the front of my home so I can see people pull up. And the uh, I, and I I got to where I could see I knew an FBI car when I saw one because they looked, had motor pool written all over them, you know. And uh, <clears throat> so this black car pulls up and stops. The passenger who's on my side of the car, gets out, removes a pistol from his shoulder holster, unbuttons his jacket, or it was already unbuttoned. Anyway, he sticks it inside his waistband and then buttons his jacket back, and they come in. <clears throat> and he was the bad guy. They do a good guy, bad guy routine, just like on TV. And uh, when the good guy wasn't getting the results that he wanted, uh, the bad guy stood up and unbuttoned his jacket and kind of pooched his belly out to show me that pistol. Um, I assume he was uh, trying to give me a message uh, that if I didn't play ball, they were going to shoot me. Well, I knew better than that. The FBI doesn't have the authority to do that. Uh, that's they, they have the authority to do a lot of things, but they're mostly cover-up people. Uh, so I didn't, I just pretended like I didn't even see the gun. I thought it was childish and foolish. And uh, anyway, they left a little disappointed. <clears throat> Later on, they sent another team out. And this time, one of the team members was a lady. And I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. I don't know what she's going to do. Is she going to try to kiss me or something? I mean, you know, how, how, how come they sent a woman? Well, it turned out she was the bad guy. Oh, man. It was funny. And uh, when they first came in and I seated them and she said, do, do you know how much trouble you're in? And I said, no, ma'am, but I'll bet you're here to tell me. <laughs> and everybody laughed, and that just kind of ruined the whole thing. I mean, once you make them laugh, it's not, you can't ever get serious again. So that, that interview was a complete bust. <clears throat> and I finally told him, I said, look, 
Why don't y'all go back and tell him you scared the hell out of me? And if anybody ever calls, I'll confirm it. <laughs> and we'll just forget the whole thing because it's, you know, you guys are wasting your time, obviously. And uh, I don't mind. I, I'm, I'm, you're entertaining me, so I don't mind you staying here. But, uh, you know, we're not going to accomplish much here. So they left. And uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, I think the first group was, came down there to make sure I understood that I was going to prison and that every time I spoke out, every time I spoke the truth, was going to be one sentence, and next time I spoke the truth, another sentence, and those sentences, prison sentences, were going to be uh, done one behind the other, what do you call it, consecutively instead of... Uh, in other words, I was going to be in jail for the rest of my life if I kept talking. And uh, that's that's what I was told. And the second one, it didn't turn out very well because once you make them laugh, it's just very difficult to get serious again. Well, and we saw with uh, a former uh, or retired Oklahoma City police officer, Don Browning, he was part of the canine unit and he was uh, doing search and rescue there at the uh, Murrah building. He he was asking questions about what was going on and you know why they were being pulled back, you know for for people to go out for the FBI to go out and pick up uh, papers. You know, uh, they they said that there were there was documentation there so uh, sec, you know so important to national security that they were going to call off the rescue. Um, he's asking questions about it. And one of the FBI agents tells him, you know, people like you that ask questions often end up dead. And he said the way that he was, uh, he it was posed to him, he felt it was a threat. You know, we see the intimidation going on. You know, obviously, you know, the Oklahoma City was a precursor to 9/11. We've seen informations come out through the MIAC reports, and you know, most recently, the uh, information that Operation Defuse uncovered about the uh, internal documents calling uh, the, the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee's website uh, domestic terrorism. Anybody that has the audacity to expose their corruption and their cover-up has to be silenced. And we see that in Hoppy's case too. You know, as he he had the intelligence to to go in and, and ask questions, demand answers, and they weren't going to allow that because it's obvious that the judicial branch was just pushing the official story and they didn't want any interference. And we do appreciate your courage, sir. Uh, could you get into, the because the film covers so much, uh, some of the other people who had untimely or suspicious deaths and some of the victims' family members you spoke to, you know, uh, really put a profile on who the real victims of this lie were? I'll let James do that. <laughs> well, uh, we talked with uh, the uh, mother of Officer Terrence Yakey. Uh, Terry Yakey was a real hero that day. You know, he saved eight people's lives, and he was brutally murdered, and his death was called a suicide. So the facts that surround that uh, are that, uh, you know, he had cut marks all on his arm. They said he bled out so much in the car that you could have dipped it out with a ladle. Uh, and then supposedly walked a mile, mile and a half away into a field and, and with marks on his wrist and his neck, uh, and then used a weapon uh, and shot himself at a downward angle far enough away that it didn't leave powder burns on his head. It was declared a suicide. You know, his family asked questions. They said he wasn't suicidal. He had everything to live for. You know, he had just you know, he was getting promotions. He got the key to the city. He had reconciled with his wife. And, you know, everything was going good. He had never had any any thoughts of suicide. Um, and when his family asked questions, they said they, that they were crazy. That they watched too much television. Well, Terry had been saying the whole time time that the official story wasn't the way it actually happened. You know, and I think that he was trying to protect his family uh, from from any danger uh, surrounding the information that he had, so he didn't share that with them. And he was going to a storage facility to uh, actually uh, work with some of the stuff that he was holding back and uh, never made it. Uh, and so it, I think it was a message. It was a message of intimidation to anybody at the time, uh, because after that, I mean, anybody else uh, that knew anything about it was silenced, you know, or else, you know, you'll end up like Officer Yankee. Um, there was uh, there was a, a lot of intimidation along the way. I know that uh, there were people that were involved in the investigation that had been threatened, um, and it, they just don't want the, 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 the official story to, to be questioned until it's solidified in the public mind. Well, Terrence Yankee's partner, Dr. Chumley, was also so killed. You might go into that. Uh, actually, uh, <clears throat> Chumley and uh, Yankee, I don't know the details of how, where they knew each other in advance. I've heard they did. But anyway, uh, they brought some of the victims. Uh, I don't remember whether ATF or DEA. They brought them down there to Dr. Chumley to bandage up, but they weren't injured. 
And Chandler said, hey, I don't have time for this. Said, These boys aren't hurt. And they said, ah, we need you to bandage them anyway. And he said, y'all get out of here. I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And supposedly, from what I've heard, uh, Yankee was there and witnessed that. And from that point on, Yankee and the doctor, uh, they rented them a lockbox, uh, I think, in a bank at, at uh, uh uh, the town off from Oklahoma City, I forget which one. And uh, they went to putting together documents and photos and things like that because they both realized that this was a complete bogus operation, that it would, wouldn't anything like what the government said. And so uh, they apparently obtained all that documentation uh, from Yankee before they killed him. And then it was some months later, I think, when uh, Dr. Chumley's plane went down. Yes, sir. Uh, in closing, just as James and the other filmmakers are bringing this case back out into the light, you disclosed earlier on the radio, you, you've got a medical issue and you're probably not going to be in the spotlight yourself. Uh, but what would you like to tell the world uh, about the importance of this case and looking forward, what it means for, for our country uh, as other events are possible, as they continue to try to clamp down on this country and, and put forward a, an evil agenda? If the American people are not willing to believe what I say and not willing to believe what they know beyond a doubt happened at 9-11 and know beyond a doubt that JFK wasn't killed by Lee Harvey Oswald, I mean, everybody understands that. If those people are not going to do anything, if they're going to sit idly by and pretend they don't know the truth and pretend they don't want to do anything, we're going to lose this country. That's a fact. I, my only hope is that God won't allow us to lose this country because he has a, an investment in it. But I, I don't know that for sure. And uh, so I think he's our only chance because it looks like American people are not going to wake up and take any action. And Aaron, this is why it's important for the viewers to go out to the Infowar store, get a copy of the movie, share this with your friends and family, and expose the methodology of state terror. Take away their power to perpetuate false flag attacks to for their own political ends. Hoppy, thank you for your courage and to all the filmmakers of A Noble Lie. And they're right, if we don't fight back against the stage terror, they're going to continue to use it against us and enslave this country, try to pull the wool over impressionable people's eyes with more and more media lies. Of course, we do have that film, A Noble Lie, at the InfoWars store. We also have a Christmas special right now at Prison Planet TV. You can get a big discount on a membership that you can share with five other friends, family members, whomever. You can give them the passcodes uh, coming up this holiday. You can also get 18 DVDs all in the shiny package with that yearly Prison Planet TV membership for $129.95. Excellent discounts. Great way to give truth this Christmas and holiday season. Uh, and for the InfoWars Nightly News, we thank you for joining us tonight. We'll be back again tomorrow.